wait for the other IT guy to show up. <laughs> All right, take your songbook and turn with me to number 524. 524. I've a home prepared for the saints of my trust over in the glory land. Save one's gone to 
protect them, guard them, guide them, uh, all of our first responders as they go out and do their jobs and try to protect us. Please, please be with our teachers as they influence our youth and help them to, to be more Christ-like through their example. Lord, thank you for all you've bestowed upon us. Bless us as we go through our day and be with Franklin as he presents our lesson. In Jesus' name, amen. If you would take this time to mark your song book number 510, I Surrender All, number 510, we'll sing this song prior to the offering this morning. song before we partake of the Lord's Supper and help prepare our minds will be number 584. 584. I know whom I have to be. We'll sing the first. We'll sing all three verses of the song. I know not why God's wondrous grace to me he hath made known, nor why unworthy Christ in love redeemed me for his own. Yeah. 
same way also he took the cup after supper saying this cup is a new covenant in my blood do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes let's pray God we thank you for this beautiful Lord's day that you've given us we thank you for the ultimate sacrifice that you made that Send your only begotten Son down to die a cruel death on the cross for our sins. Father, at this time we we take this bread and we ask that you watch over us and, and that we take it in a manner that's well pleasing in your sight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time that we have to remember you and to think of you and to remember you on the cross for us where the blood was shed for each and every one of us. And Lord, we love the, the poor out of you. We appreciate it so much. Lord, we pray that we take this cup in a manner that's well pleasing in your sight. In Jesus' name we pray.
I surrender all. We'll sing all three verses and then conclude with the refrain. All to Jesus I surrender. You wouldn't mark at this time the song following the lesson this morning will be number 424. Mark the gentle voice, number 424. After you place your mark there, you would then uh, turn to number 621. Leaning on the everlasting arms, number 621. I know it's warm in here, but I'm going to ask if you would please stand for the song. <laughs>
census looked at churches of Christ, disciples of Christ, Christian church. That was the first official division, as at least noted by the federal government, between the churches of Christ and the disciples of Christ. Now that broke down over the simple fact of people wanting to add instrumental music into the worship. It started off simply enough, people would buy a piano and an organ, and they put it in the building. They say, we're only going to use this for funerals and weddings. So everything is fine. We're going to sing like we normally do on the Lord's Day. And when we worship on Wednesday nights. But if there's a special occasion, we're going to add the piano. We're going to add the organ. And then time would go by. The preaching would change a little bit. The younger people would come up. You know what? Those pianos and organs are pretty neat. Well, let's go ahead and add them into the worship service. And there were some people there who said, no, that's not mentioned in the Bible. We're not going to change the Lord's worship. We're going to keep them out. And there will be a split. Nine times out of ten, those splits would end up in the court system. And for some reason, like always happens, the liberals would win. The group that had brought in the organ and the piano would get the building and the members of the Lord's Church would have to leave and start another congregation. Now I'll bring that to mind because back in the 80s and then in the early 90s, another thing came up. Members of the Lord's Church decided, hey, we can associate, we can fellowship with these people, the Christian Church, <coughs> Pardon me, I didn't think that was going to happen today. <coughs> we can fellowship with these folks. They actually hadn't paid attention to the fact that there had actually been another split between the Christian church and the disciples of Christ because even more liberal people had come in and forced a split into that group. But these people, members of the Lord's church, said, we can fellowship with them. We can get together and worship with them. We can study with them. There's nothing wrong with that. Everything is perfectly fine. And to this day, there are still major issues. There's hardly a congregation of the Lord's Church out there that will say, you know, we don't want to have people who fellowship with the Christian Church or with the Disciples of Christ or with any other denomination. Many years ago, we were working to feed the homeless, which is a very good idea. You know, Jesus himself. Okay, this is not what it looks like. <laughs> uh, for those of you who are old enough, this is a word. Better be <laughs> um, Juanita was here, she really thought that. She was on the hot bed of it. Thank you. Where was I? Oh, yes. Uh, they were trying to work things out. And they wanted to work with these groups that were feeding the homeless. Again, a very worthwhile idea. And one of the deacons brought up, why don't we show the Jules Miller movies while we are feeding the homeless? 
we could at least teach them the gospel while they're here in our building eating. He was told, no, you can't do that. It might offend the people that we've worked so hard to build a working relationship with. So, while we did end up feeding the people stomachs, we did not feed them spiritually. There's a major issue with that, folks. Who can we fellowship with? Now, a lot of people will use, there's a couple of verses they really love to use to say, yeah, it's perfectly fine. Let's go to the book of Mark. <clears throat> go to chapter 9, verse 40. The book of Mark, chapter 9, verse 40. For he that is not against us is on our part. And that story is repeated again in Luke 9, 50. The Gospel of Luke, chapter 9, verse 50. And Jesus said unto him, Forbid him, forbid him not, for he that is not against us is for us. That's all well and good. Sounds fun. The problem is they pulled it out of context. What is Jesus talking about here? He is warning his disciples that in the future, the governments, the religious leaders are going to attack them. They will be brought before trials. People are going to be testifying against them. But these people who are now teaching in Jesus' name are not going to be able to get up in the witness stand and say, hey, Jesus is a false messiah. He's lying. Because here they are, in public, witnessing to the truth of Jesus. So you cannot apply these two verses to say that we can fellowship with just anybody that calls themselves a Christian. So who can we be in fellowship with? Let's go to the book of 1 John, chapter 1, verse 7. First John 1, 7. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. <coughs> There's a fellow named David Jones, a gospel preacher, he said the following about this verse. Among the other things learned from this verse, it must be noted that we have fellowship with each other only when we walk in the light, which is God's word. With whom I am fellowship in this life is not left in my choosing. God has told me what I must do in order to go to heaven. If I am in fellowship with God, keeping his commandments, and if someone else is in fellowship with God, we are automatically in fellowship with one another. To break my fellowship with God means I must break my fellowship with men walking in the light. That is a very simple and curt statement. As long as somebody else is doing what God tells them to do, then we are in fellowship with them as long as we are doing what God tells us to do. If somebody is doing something different, we can't be in fellowship with them. Because if we decide to walk with them, guess what? We're no longer walking with God. Amos 3.3. 3. Slide back to the Old Testament. Book of Amos, chapter 3, verse 3. Can two walk together except they be agreed. And I just mentioned that. Now, if we're walking together with a nominational group, we would have to, in some way, be in agreement with them. When we're walking with God, we are in agreement with God. Again, David Jones spoke, the purity of Christian fellowship is being contaminated by garbage heaps of denominationalism. It is Satan, through the mouths of modern-day gainsayers, who has sown these tears for division. Matthew 13, 39. He first divided men from God and now seeks to divide men from each other by fooling mankind into ignoring God's absolute standard. For those who cling to the Bible and respect its authoritative words, there is still a sweetness and purity in their fellowship that is experienced when, we, when they come together because they haven't agreed to disagree in matters of faith. Rather, they insist that no man can disagree when God has spoken and still preserve ties that were bound by the love of God's truth. These are the Christians who are truly making a difference in the world around them. They are calling all men to God's church through God's Son and by God's way. Now, but going back to the Bible, we have a common standard, folks. No ifs, ands, 
or buts. This is our common standard. 2 Timothy 3.16. I'm sure everybody is familiar with this. 2 Timothy 3.16. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. A lot of people have real issues with using the Bible for reproof. I think everybody knows what that means. If somebody's making a mistake, you go to the Bible to correct them. Not a man-made creed, not something written by somebody in the 1600s. You go to the Bible. For correction, the same thing. You use the Bible to correct errors that we have. Like I told you before, if I'm making a mistake, I want somebody to tell me I'm book, chapter, verse. Let me know. Because when you bring me back to the truth, you make sure I stay on that straight and narrow path and we get to heaven. Instruction on righteousness. That's what we're supposed to teach from, folks. Just the Bible. You don't need anything more. That the man of God may be perfect. Again, I mentioned before, the word perfect does not necessarily mean what we think of it, what we use it from day to day. Perfect means complete, means mature, doing the best you possibly can, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. We can learn everything that we need to know from the Bible. We don't need a man to teach us anything. Let's go to 2 Peter. 2 Peter 1, verse 2. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of, our, and of Jesus our Lord. The knowledge of God. Again, we just mentioned it. God has told us everything we need to know about Him. What He desires. What He wants us to do. That's where the grace is too. That's where peace is. As long as you are walking in God's light, you can have a peace in your heart. You don't have to worry about things. Because you know that the master of the universe loves you and is going to take care of you. Now since we do have this one standard, we have we must avoid the traditions of men. Paul wrote to the Colossians in chapter 2, verse 8. Colossians 2, 8. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit, after traditions of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. Every denomination out there is started by a man, folks. Not by Jesus. Not by God. It wasn't a message sent to a prophet. It was just something that a man thought up and decided to write down. Then he binds it on somebody else. 1 Timothy 1.3 As I besought thee to abide at Ephesus when I went into Macedonia, that thou mightest charge some that they teach no other doctrine. Paul here is telling his friend Timothy that he is supposed to go someplace and tell them not to preach a foreign doctrine. Not just sit there, let them teach it, and hope it will go away. No, you've got to actually stand up. You've got to get up to them. You've got to communicate to them. You read to them from the Bible, and you tell them you can't teach that. That's something that we need to do also. 1 Peter 4.11 If any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. If any man minister, let him do it as of the ability which God giveth, that men in all things may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom be praise and dominion forever and ever. Amen. The oracles of God. Again, folks, right here. If it's on your phone, that's fine. You've got a leather bound or a paper leather bound or a paperback or a hardback. Words are the same, folks. God gave them all those years ago. Don't have to worry about it. It's the truth. Micah 6 8. Way back in the Old Testament again, the prophet Micah, Micah spoke. Verse, chapter 6, verse 8. He has showed thee, O man, what is good. And what doth the Lord require of thee but to do justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with God? Can two men agree? Come on, folks. They're walking. We've got to be together with God. That's how we need to walk with our lives. And it's not just coming to church on Sundays or Wednesdays. You've got to do it every day. Genesis 5, 22 through 24. 
And Enoch walked with God after he begat Methuselah 300 years and begat sons and daughters. And all the days of Enoch were 360 and 5. And Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. Now we'll hear about Enoch again in the book of Hebrews 11.5. Hebrews 11.5. By faith, Enoch was translated that he should not see death, and was not found, because God had translated him. For before his translation, he had this testimony, that he pleased God. So how do you walk with God? You please him. And you please him if you walk with him. A lot of people will tell you, we make mistakes all the time. How can we be pressured to walk with God? I mean, here I am, I'm 30 years old. Not me, but just somebody generally speaking. <laughs> how can I be expected to walk with God all the time? Well, think how long Enoch had to walk with God. He was 365 years old when he was translated. So at least 300 of that, he was walking the way God wanted him to do it. I know we're all going to make mistakes. I'm sure Enoch did too. He was not perfect, but he pleased God. We can do it for the 60, 70 years that we have on this earth if we struggle and we try. Let's go to the book of Hebrews again, verse 11, I mean, chapter 11, verse 6. But without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Got to come to God, folks. You can't just sit there and expect God to come to us. We've got to take those steps. We've heard it before hear, believe, repent. Five little steps doesn't take much. Yes, I will admit it's harder to walk with God for the rest of your life, but you've got to do it. 2 John 1 9 through 11. 2 John 1 9 through 11. Whoever transgresseth, transgresseth, and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ, hath not God. He that abideth in the doctrine of Christ, he hath both the Father and the Son. If there come any unto you, and bring not this doctrine, receive him not into your house, and neither bid him God speak. For he that biddeth him God speak is a partaker of his evil deeds. Now that's the final warning, folks. You may think you're doing something wonderful. But... If those people were actually doing something wrong, let's say we're working with a denomination to feed people. Again, feeding people is a worthwhile deal. Giving them clothes, that's great, wonderful. But if they're out there teaching false doctrine, and we've already read several verses that talk about how the importance of doctrine, if we're helping them do that, we're just as guilty as they are in spreading that false God, that doctrine. Because we to be looked at by the world. And they're saying, well, this group associates with that group, so we can hang out with these folks too, I mean, just as good. If they're teaching faith only, and we're supporting them, and giving food or clothing or what have you, people are going to look at us the same as them. They're not going to look past them to see us. And God is going to hold us responsible for that. We can't just go by the name on the sign either. There are far too many congregations that have slipped into denominationalism. And I know I've told the story before years ago. Billy Harper went down to a, another congregation he was going to teach for a day. And Donald Wade, he followed down, but he left after us. He didn't leave too much behind us, so we were all startled when he wandered into the building about 15 minutes late. And at the end of the service, he said, well, I stopped at the first building and said, Church of Christ... And I knew I had an issue when I walked in and saw the drum set sitting on the stage. You just can't look at the sign on the wall. Again, there are many congregations of the Lord's Church that have fallen away. They may still wear the sign, or they may have changed it. Has anybody seen the sign that says something, Community Church, and on the bottom of it says, A Church of Christ? There was a TV show that I used to love to watch called Duck Dynasty. Anybody remember that? If you look at the sign on the outside of their church, something is a church of Christ. They were no longer a congregation of the Lord's church. They were fun to, to watch. They were neat guys. They seemed to live wholesome lives. But they were not Christians, folks. They had gone into the denominational world. 
Joshua 24, 31. And Israel served the Lord all the days of Joshua, and all the days of the elders that overlived Joshua, and which had known all the works of the Lord that he had done for Israel. Every generation is at risk of falling away. We have got to teach our children what is important, to focus on the Bible so that they don't fall away. We don't teach them the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, which according to Jessica, they never stay in the courtroom anymore. Our children are going to be in trouble. We don't owe it to those who came before us to teach the truth. We owe it to our children. That is the most important thing in the world. God entrusted them to us to raise correctly, to lead them to Him. Don't care what a certain political party is saying now. The children are our trust, not the government's trust, not the school system's trust. It's our duty and our responsibility. Now, if there's anybody here today who has any issues, wants to be baptized, we can make that happen. Or who has any issues that want to talk about, please come forward. It's Jamie Lee just in this song. Hark the gentle voice of Jesus, Lord, and Somewhere, let's 
sing for my name. I'll be somewhere listening, I'll be somewhere listening, I'll be somewhere listening for my name. I'll be somewhere listening, I'll be somewhere listening, I'll be somewhere listening for my name. If my robe is white when he calls me, if my robe is white, I will hear. If my robe is white when he calls me, I'll be somewhere listening for my name. I'll be somewhere listening, I'll be somewhere listening, I'll be somewhere listening for my name. I'll be somewhere listening, I'll be somewhere listening, I'll be somewhere listening for my name. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you so much for all the wonderful blessings that you give us. We thank you for allowing us to be here this morning to worship you and sing songs of your praise. We pray, Father, that everything we did today and this morning was in accordance with your will and that which you would be proud of us. We pray, Father, at this time for the sick of our number. We pray that you would be with them and be with their families. We pray that you will heal them and bring them back to a normal state of health. Bring them back to us. We pray, Father, for those that have lost loved ones recently. We pray that you will comfort their families and, and be with them. We pray, Father, for our young people. We pray that you will uh, be with them and always guide and direct them. We pray, Father, for this congregation that meets here. We pray that you will continue to bless us, continue to be with us. We're so thankful for everything that you have given us. We are thankful for the leadership we have here, and we are thankful for uh, everything that you have done. At this time, Father, as we go to our classes, we pray that you will be with us and bless us and Help us to learn more about your word. We ask that you would forgive us of all of our sins and you would guide, guard, and protect us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.